Lord created us so we can worship Him. Not His creation, nor His creatures, only Him. Associate none as a partner with your Lord. As true believers, that's a sin we can't afford. He is the only one worthy of our praise. We all depend on Him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As we know, Islam is spread by the winning of the hearts. And the next lecture will explore just how we can become leaders in spreading the goodness of Islam. We're very fortunate to have with us Sheikh Yawa Beg to talk to us on the topic of being a standard bearer of Islam. Before I hand over to Sheikh Yawa, just a little bit about him for your benefit. He is the founder and president of a company by the name of Yawa Beg and Associates. He's also an international speaker, a life coach, and a corporate consultant whose main work is in teaching and mentoring young leaders around the world. In his training and consultancy work, Sheikh Yawa combines Eastern values with Western systems in order to transcend the uh, cultural boundaries and produce high quality leaders, inshallah. Speaking five languages, his style reflects openness, commitment to quality, and value-based professionalism. He studied at the Jamia Ilihiya Nuraniya in Hyderabad initially, and then later went on to complete studies in Saudi Arabia and the United States, amongst other places. He is also the chairman of the Standard Bearers Academy, so he is obviously the right person to talk to us about being a standard bearer of Islam. I'd like to invite Sheikh Yawa to the stage in order to address us on this topic. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasuli al-kareem. Amma bad. My presentation today is about a topic that I'm sure is in the hearts of all of us. And that topic begins with the question, what can I, as a single individual, not what can I as the head of a country, not what can another head of a country, not what a corporate head, not what this government or that government can or should do, what can I, as an individual, Muslim, what can we do to present a beautiful picture of Islam as Islam is? What can I do as a person? And that is why I begin, I've termed this thing being a standard bearer of Islam. For those of you who uh, this term might be new to, a standard bearer is the one who holds the flag of the army in battle. There are two things about the standard bearer. One, he holds the flag of the army in battle. And that is why the entire battalion looks at the flag to see if it is still flying. And the two is the standard bearer is never armed. The standard bearer's only job is to keep the flag of the battalion flying. He's not armed, he's not fighting anybody. He's just keeping the flag flying. And that is the job of the standard bearer. And I ask you to ask yourself this question. Are you prepared to become standard bearers of Islam? My brothers and sisters, being a standard bearer of Islam to me is a labor of love and a legacy of honor. We do this because we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do this because we love his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We do this because we are proud and confident to be called Muslim. And we do this because we wish to be remembered with honor when we are gone. So our legacy to the world my question to myself and to you is to ask, what do we want it to be? Let me ask you a question. 
If mobile phones disappeared from the face of the earth, would you feel a difference? Yes or no? Yes. And why would you feel a difference? Because mobile phones are beneficial to us. And it is in the nature of human beings to regret the passing of something which is beneficial. The question I want to ask you to ask our non-Muslim brothers and sisters, let us ask them, if Islam and all the signs of Islam and all the Muslims that they know and they do not know personally were wiped off the face of the planet, would anything be lost for you? If you, the Australians and the Americans and the Europeans and the Indians and the whoever, who are not yet Muslim, who have not entered Islam, if you wake up tomorrow morning and you find that there are no more Muslims on the face of the earth, would that make a difference to you? Would you feel that something is lost or would you say, thank God they're gone? Which one? I want you to ask people this question. You know what answers I got? Alhamdulillah, those are my friends who are, I think, probably very polite. They said, well, you know, if you die, we will regret that. So I said, I'm not talking about me dying. I'm saying if there are no Muslims on the face of the earth. And of course, they're very polite, so they remain silent. My question to myself and to you, my brothers and sisters, is how are we benefiting those whom we are supposed to benefit. Why do I say supposed to benefit? Because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to do. Alhamdulillah, the two learned scholars before me confirmed and reaffirmed this point before I came. With the ahadith of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I want to put before you the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Imran, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas. Did Allah say ukhrijat min an nas? Allah said ukhrijat lin nas. Allah did not say you are the best of people extracted from amongst the human beings. Allah said you are the best of people extracted and selected for the human beings, for lin nas for the people. And what is it you do? And Allah says, what do you do? You cause benefit to all of mankind. You enjoin what is good. You enjoin what is beneficial. You enjoin and you encourage people to do things which are good for the whole of mankind and you stop people and you warn people against doing things that cause harm. Enjoining good and forbidding evil is not just to make fatwa on what is halal and what is haram. Enjoining good and forbidding evil is related to everything that, that is beneficial and everything that is harmful. We were sent to benefit all of mankind. So let's ask ourselves, are we fulfilling this purpose? Are we fulfilling this purpose? And you know who we need to ask this question to? We need to ask our customers. In another incarnation, I am a leadership trainer. And one of the kinds of leadership training I do is on customer service. So we tell people, I'm not going to ask you how good do you think your service is. Let me ask your customers how good do they think your service is because that is how good your service actually is. So who are our customers? Who are the customers of the Muslims of this world? Everyone who is not yet a Muslim. So let's ask them, do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent us to benefit you? Do you think we are benefiting you or not? So where is the shortfall? Let me describe the objective of our lives as I see it, my brothers and sisters. It is to do three things. Number one is to live a life of such grace 
that we benefit everyone and everything that shares this planet with us. The human beings, the animals, the birds, the fish in the oceans, the trees, the atmosphere, to live a life of such grace that we benefit all those who share the planet with us. It is to live a life where we are seen as role models and benchmarks of integrity, of quality, and of contribution. Three things where we are seen as the benchmarks for this. If someone wants to know what is the meaning of quality of life, who should he look to? A Muslim. If someone wants to know the meaning of integrity, who should he look to? A Muslim. If someone wants to look and see who contributes, what is the meaning of contribution in this world, who should they look to? A Muslim. And the third one is to live a life where all those around us are delighted and thankful that we live amongst them and they regret our passing. That is the goal. So what should we do? One of the things I teach is recovery from cataclysmic disasters. And we say it's very important to do three things. Number one, face the brutal facts. There is only one person in the world you can fool, and you know who that is? Yourself. No one else. So stop fooling yourself. Face the brutal facts, number one. Number two, but never lose hope in eventual success. Because we do not have despair from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the third very important thing to remember is that excuses don't change the facts. Excuses don't turn failure to success. My brothers and sisters, in the life of every man and woman comes a time when a window of opportunity opens. And we have, for a short period, a unique opportunity to make an impact and to influence others. Those who succeed are the ones who anticipate and prepare for it, and who recognize and act it when it opens. If we don't take advantage of the window of opportunity in our lives, my brothers and sisters, one day that window closes. And remember, when that window is closed, our life is over, even if we remain alive. My question to myself and you is, I believe that our window is open now. Are we ready to take advantage of that? My brothers and sisters, the world needs standard bearers of Islam like a drowning man needs to be rescued. The world today is existing on a failed system. They know the system doesn't work. They know it doesn't work. They know that system is causing them endless misery. But what do you expect them to do when those who know the solution are deliberately keeping silent. What do you expect the blind man to do when he is walking on the street and he's blind and he's stumbling and he's falling and he's hurting himself and the man who has eyes is sitting there and watching him and laughing at him and saying, look at them, what a lousy system they have. Look at them, what a horrible system they have. SubhanAllah, that is our job. Or is it our job to go and say to them, look, we've got a better system than this, come and try it out. Which is our job? So who's a standard bearer of Islam? Who's a standard bearer? One, a standard bearer is a person who stands for and exemplifies the standard in which he or she believes, not someone who just talks. Mercy Mission's motto, knowledge and action, not somebody who just talks somebody who walks the talk. A standard bearer is one who stands up and differentiates on the basis of the standard that he or she exemplifies. And what is that standard? That standard is Islam. And a standard bearer is one who the world will call a stranger. Why will the world call a standard bearer of Islam a stranger? Because today we live in a world that is sunk in corruption. A person who stands up against corruption will be called a stranger. Today we are sunk in a world 
that revels in discrimination. A person who stands up for equality will be called a stranger. Today we live in a world where society, the moral and ethical values of society have been destroyed to such an extent that people have even forgotten what those values were. A person who stands up and talks about those values and exemplifies and lives by those values and makes decisions by those values will be called a stranger. My a question to you, my brothers and sisters, are you prepared to be called strangers? Yes or no? Then let me give you the glad tidings of Jannah. I do not give the glad tidings to you. I tell you the words of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, Bada al-Islam gharibhan, sayaudu gharibhan kama bada, fatuba lil ghuraba, aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Islam began as something strange. When Islam came into the world, people said, who are these strangers? Who are these strange people who are talking about equality of women? Women are chattels. Women are our possessions. We take them and leave them as we wish. We slaughter them if we want to. We kill them, we sell them, we buy them. Who is somebody to say that women are actually human? Who is somebody to say that women have rights? Who is somebody to say that women will inherit and own property? Who is somebody to say that a woman is equal to a man? Who is the strange man? And that man was Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam began as something strange. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, a time will come when once again, the Muslims will stand up for what their Rabb told them to do. And they will be called strangers. People will say, who are these strangers? And Rasulullah said, when that time comes, give the glad tidings of Jannah, of Tuba, to those who the world will call strangers. The time, my brothers and sisters, is now. My brothers and sisters, I ask you to differentiate. Why differentiate? because only the outstanding stand out. If you ask me, as I told you in another incarnation, I teach leadership. And if you tell me, describe the secret of leadership in one word, and that word is differentiate. And to differentiate, you have to learn to swim against the current. I know Australians like fishing. I love fishing as well. And anybody who fishes knows that only a dead fish goes with the current. Life fish swim against the current. So who is our standard? What is the standard we are talking about? Our standard is the one who was sent as a standard for all of humankind. And who was set up as a standard and the one who sent him said about him, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرَةِ وَذَكَرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best standard for all of humankind. And that is the standard that is our challenge to exemplify. I believe there are six critical elements to becoming a standard bearer. I'm going to quickly go over them. Number one, it begins with the aqeedah. And what is the aqeedah? Very quickly. It is the creed, it's what we believe. It is tawheed. The worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and asking of help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without any partners. The following of the sunnah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sallam, sallam and a belief in the akhirah and accountability to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every action that we do, we do it only for one reason which is to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is ibadah. And in ibadah three things. Number one, the usul, which comes with knowledge, learn how to do it properly. Number two, the fiqh of the ibadah, the ahkam of the ibadah. And number three, the internality of the ibadah. If the ibadah is wrong with respect to its externality, that is bad. But if the ibadah is wrong with respect to its internality, about which Rasulullah said, Anta'budu Allah ka'annaka tara. He said, worship Allah as if you see him. And if you do not see him, know that he sees you. The connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Third one is akhlaq. My brothers and sisters, our aqeedah is inside our hearts. Our ibadat, for the most part, are inside our masajid or inside our homes. The only time the outside world gets to see what is a Muslim is when we interact with them, and that is where our manners and our akhlaq count. The Sheikh talked about the importance of smiling. SubhanAllah, I mean, I sometimes ask myself, have we reached such a level that we need to be, in, to be informed and we need to be reminded even to smile? Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi And that, but he's right. He's right. Somewhere we have this, I call it this bimari of taqaddus. My Urdu-speaking friends will recognize that. This this illness of taqaddus, the illness of holiness. The moment you become religious, you think now you can't smile at anybody. Any, anyone wants to shake hands with me, first make wudu. <laughs> A sense of humor is haram. <laughs> I mean, we, we, have to, we have to loosen up. People in my other incarnation, again, I keep on changing incarnation. The other incarnation, sales training, I tell people you can only sell to friends. You can't sell to enemies. You can't sell to a chap who doesn't want to see your face. You can only sell to friends. So you want to go make dawah, become people's friends. Let them love you, man. I like Sheikh Hussain, his accent of love. You know? <laughs> Let them love. Seriously, I'm not, I'm not making fun of him. I love the man. man. I mean, he's my ustad. I mean, if people don't love you, if people don't like your face, if people don't, don't even want to come near you, the Sheikh said, the, the, the Sheikh Abu Hamza, I mean, these people are just taking their word for it. He said, look good and smell good. Important, yeah? So what is akhlaq? Tazkiyah, internal clarification, cleaning yourself, internal outside, tarbiya, upbringing of children, and service. Do good to people. Go and help people. Do an insane act of kindness every day. Be unreasonably kind. Go give somebody a gift, not because it's a birthday or something. Just like that, give them a gift. Number four, mu'amilat. Our dealings with people. How do we deal with people? We need to know the fiqh of mu'amilat, the knowledge of business, of dealings, and so on and so forth. Then we need to implement it. And that implementation itself is da'wah. That itself is invitation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday there was an incident here. I don't know Allah whether it was involved with the Muslim. One of our sisters, she lost her Blackberry in the mall. So she left her Blackberry in the mall. So I said, you know, somebody told me it's gone and I, 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 maybe, maybe it will come back. I said, yeah, yeah, maybe, it'll, maybe the cow will jump over the moon, you know. <laughs> a Blackberry free. If, I, if, if somebody gets it, they will say, very nice, thank you very much. You know, this is whoever it belongs to. But you know what actually happened? Her husband, my friend, my brother Sajid here, he gets a phone call and this person says, excuse me, I think it's your wife's phone. I've got your wife's phone. Please come and take it. And the person who gave this phone is a graduate of Medina University, is Mufti Azam of Saudi Arabia, and this person is a, is, 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 is a, is a, is a great scholar of Islam. Yes or no? No, this person is a sales girl, an Australian sales girl working in one of the shops in this mall. May Allah bless her and may Allah reward her. She is an example of what is the, what I see, my first visit to Australia, but I see that behavior as an example of the culture of this beautiful city of Melbourne, inshallah. She is a representative of Melbourne, as far as I'm concerned. When I go back and people say, what was the experience of Melbourne? I'll say, you know what? People actually return blackberries. <laughs> if you want to go lose your blackberries somewhere, go and do it in Melbourne. <laughs> Ajeeb, yeah? SubhanAllah. Why am I saying that? Because Muamila, people listen with their eyes, man. People don't listen with their ears. People listen with their eyes. They don't care. You can talk to them till the cows come home. They are going to look at what you're doing. And out of all this, when you have beautiful akhlaq, when you have beautiful dealings, you create a beautiful society. You're talking about creating communities. How do communities get created? Not by architecture, not by houses, not by multi-million dollar masajid. They get created by beautiful akhlaq, by beautiful manners, and by beautiful dealings. 
so that the people among whom you live, they love you. They want you to be there. And if you are gone, they regret that. And what is the mu'ashara? What is the beautiful Islamic model of mu'ashara? Compassion for each other. Responsibility for one another. And a sharing of goodness with everybody. Take this model, my challenge to you, take this model to the person who hates Islam more than anything else and tell him how would you like to live in a society which is based on compassion, on responsibility, and on sharing, and tell me what they tell you. And that results in being and creating a global standard, a standard of thought leadership, a standard of uncompromising integrity, and total quality. So what do we need to do? The issue is, my brothers and sisters, the fact of life of Muslims is we all know everything. We all know everything. We just don't know how to do it. And that's the reason why it's important to show people who, how, when they know the why. Who does not know that Salah is fard, for God's sake? But we've got to figure out how to do it in terms of finding time in our busy schedules. And why must we do this? Because only when people see a benefit for themselves will they adopt our way. The finest example of this is Montessori education. One woman, Maria Montessori in Germany, decided that little children like to play, they don't like to work, but we need to teach them. So how do you teach them? Teach them through play. She invents a system, she creates a system, and the whole world has Montessori schools. No force, no nothing. My brothers and sisters, success has a price. Everything has a price, so does success. People don't succeed, not because they don't want to succeed, but because they don't want to pay the price. And the reason they don't pay the price is because they have not defined success. And so I ask you, do you have a written down definition of success for yourself in this world? And to me, a good definition is one which you can measure. How do I know I'm successful? How, what is the measurement for that? So what do you need to do? Four things that you need to do, or five things. Write your success definition. Look at what you need to invest in yourself. What challenges do you foresee? What's your timetable? What's your resource table? And your clarity of all this is the key. Success, my brothers and sisters, is between ambivalence on one corner and passion on another corner. Success is to find your viewpoint, and believe me, it is skewed towards passion. You will only succeed in something that you are passionate about, because passion rarely fails. My brothers and sisters, my last slide. The world is waiting to be introduced to its creator. Who is the creator of the world? How did he introduce himself? I want to remind you, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about himself, and he said that if this kalam of his was sent down onto a mountain, the mountain would humble itself because of the khashyat of Allah. I ask myself and you to think about what happens to the mountain, which is which we call our heart. What does it do with the khashyat of Allah? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَىٰ جَبَلِ اللَّهَ رَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِئًا مُتَصَدِّيًا خَاشِئًا مُتَصَدِّيًا مِّنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ لَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduced himself and the translation is on the screen. He said, هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوَ عَالِمُ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادِ Subhanallahyamayushrikun. هو الله الخالق الباري المسفر له الأسماء الحسنى يصبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم صدق الله العظيم سبحانك اللهم بيمدك ونشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك اللهم ونتوب إليك I exceeded my time by three minutes and I'm still here جزاك الله خير Allah created us so we can worship Him 
Not his creation nor his creatures, only him. Associate none as a partner with your Lord. As true believers, that's a sin we can't afford. He is the only one worthy of our praise. We all depend on him. On him. On him. Allah created us so we can worship him. Not his creation nor his creatures, only him. Associate none as a partner.